Good evening. Well, thanks for being here tonight, and uh, welcome to all those who are joining online as well. Um, just want to start off with a with some facts. Um, according to the National Weather Service, each year the United States averages some 10,000 thunderstorms, 5,000 floods, 1,300 tornadoes, and two Atlantic hurricanes, as well as widespread droughts and fires. Weather, water, and climate events cause an average of approximately 650 deaths and $15 billion in damage per year. They're responsible for some 90% of all presidentially declared disasters. About one-third of the U.S. economy, some $3 trillion, is sensitive to weather and climate. As you just heard, these storms can result in massive damages and loss of life. Storms can start without warning and can certainly not easily be mitigated or halted. But what about storms that do have a purpose? And that's what we'll explore tonight. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for everyone who could be here tonight, for all those listening on the live stream. Um, help us with our, our own storms in our lives. Help us with our faith because you are the originator of faith. You're the one true almighty God. Bless my words tonight. Um, help me to convey and to um, share your word uh, with all those who are willing to hear it. Amen. So the main text tonight, scripture reading, is from Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. And I'll read it to us, starting in verse 35. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this? that even the wind and the sea obey him. First point tonight, there's three points. First point, have faith when you experience uncertain times. The disciples did not know how they would survive this storm. In another translation, it says, They pointedly say to Jesus, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Their minds went to the worst possible scenario. I'm sure you can relate. That meeting at work is going so poorly, I'll definitely be kicked off the project. Or the doctor called, and it must be to give me the worst possible diagnosis. Or you hear a family member has been in an accident, and your mind goes to a very dark place. These scenarios we play out in our head are based on the uncertainty that we face. We want to fill that blank, and the enemy loves to help us. So they phrase this question, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? As a foregone foregone conclusion, they believe they're going to die. But are they really? Were they really? After all, in verse 35, Jesus says, On that day... Verse 35 says, On that day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. Jesus usually knows what he's talking about. Sorry, he definitely knows what he's talking about. He was feeling 
relaxed enough or maybe tired enough to take a rest during this storm. He was asleep on the cushion. He was certain that they would get to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. You see, what when the future, uh, even the immediate future, is uncertain, Jesus is not shaken. He's not surprised by the current circumstances. He can see what is past that, but we cannot. We need to rely on him in faith so that he can be our anchor in the storm. Uh, I have a poem that I want to read to you. It's not going to be on the screen, um, but I invite you to close your eyes to kind of allow this imagery to work best. So it's a, book, it's a poem called Little Exercise by Elizabeth Bishop. So it goes like this. Think of the storm roaming the sky uneasily, like a dog looking for a place to sleep in. Listen to it growling. Think how they must look now, the mangrove keys lying out there, unresponsive to the lightning, in a dark, in dark, coarse fibered families, where occasionally a heron may undo his head, shake up his feathers, make an uncertain comment when the surrounding water shines. Think of the boulevard and the little palm trees all stuck in rows, suddenly revealed as fistfuls of limp fish skeletons. It is raining there, the boulevard and its broken sidewalks with weeds in every crack are relieved to be wet, the sea to be freshened. Now the storm goes away again in a series of small, badly lit battle scenes, each in another part of the field. Think of someone sleeping in the bottom of a rowboat tied to a mangrove root or the pile of a bridge. Think of him as uninjured, barely disturbed. Now this is not a poem about, you can open your eyes if you're. <laughs> now this is a poem, not a poem about Jesus calming the storm, but it is about a storm. It touches on the fact that it's possible, as the author Bishop puts it, to be barely disturbed when a massive, horrific storm comes. Like this author, we can look at the storms in our lives with a lens that sees the bigger picture, a lens that shows us these storms are temporary, however difficult and trying they may be. She entitles her poem, Little Exercise. I interpret this as little concern or little effort, best portrayed by the man sleeping in the rowboat, barely disturbed. Jesus was also sleeping in a boat. He was not shaken. He was not disturbed until his disciples woke him up. We should follow his example in uncertain times. And most importantly, he will not fail in helping to calm the storm we're facing. Point number two, have faith when you're afraid. Sometimes it's easy for us to be hard on the disciples throughout the gospel narratives. I mean, so many times they just don't get it, right? Jesus explains to them multiple times over and over again, get his message across to them. He had just preached about faith in the narrative, in the gospel narrative of Mark, as a small, as small as a mustard seed. Uh, just the passage right before in Mark 4, verse 30. And he said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what, compar or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. So faith starts out small like a mustard seed. Um, but that's not the end destination. It's intended that we grow in our faith. The disciples were on a faith journey, just like each and every one of us. So when they didn't understand the teachings from Jesus, 
that sometimes we take for granted, I think we can cut them a little slack. But back to the passage. This storm on the Sea of Galilee that particular night was a life and death crisis. The disciples responded in a very understandable way. They resorted to fear, to being afraid. We don't know who exactly were in the boat with Jesus because there were multiple boats of disciples, but it's often noted that several of the disciples, such as Andrew, Peter, James, and John, were experienced career fishermen. They would have understood that storms or squalls can come with very little notice on this particular lake. They undoubtedly had survived many storms in their life up until this point. But this storm was different. It was sent with an intent. This storm showed no signs of passing, and and their boat was taking on water fast. Having witnessed the ferocity and the power of this storm, they reacted by turning to the only one who could help, their teacher, Jesus. The gospel accounts from Matthew and Mark both include Jesus' reply, Why are you so afraid? And what we just read in Mark goes on to say, have you still no faith? So in a way, Jesus is comparing fear and faith. Now, we have to be a little bit cautious here. Um, Fear and faith are not necessarily direct opposites. Um, The type of fear that I'm talking about, the type that the disciples faced that stormy night, It was a crippling, paralyzing fear of something out of their control. There's also a reverent fear, which is, you know, a respect of God's authority and power and a desire to please him. The fear of the Lord is an expression found throughout scripture. I'm not saying we shouldn't have reverent fear of our almighty God, but what I'm focusing on is the fear that the disciples experienced in the storm. If the disciples had had more faith, if they had trusted God in their outcome, their fear would have subsided. But we like to hold on to fear. It's familiar to us. We can always go back to it to play out all the scenarios. Jesus says so much in his short reply, paraphrasing, if you had more faith, you wouldn't have to be so afraid. It's a conscious decision that we make to choose fear over faith. We cannot eliminate fear completely. It's a natural response to so many situations. But we can choose our focus on trusting God's promises rather than falling victim to the what-ifs. God is in control. Jesus says in John 14, verse 27, Peace I leave you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Those who know me best uh, know that I'm a big fan of Batman. Um, Batman resonates with me on a few different levels. Um, Number one, he has a lot of cool gadgets. So as a kid... uh, I had my own little bat cave, uh, just a little portion of a closet in my house. I had good parents. They let me have that. Um, (laughs) But, you know, he's got gadgets. He's got a utility belt full of different things, a battering, a grappling gun, all cool stuff that you would just love to, to play with, right? Number two, he's a realistic hero in the sense that, um, He's not from another planet. Uh, He's a master criminal investigator. Uh, He's trained in martial arts. But in the end, he's a guy, a very rich guy, but still somewhat relatable. Um, But another thing that kind of draws me to, and and I'm going to shift to the Dark Knight trilogy here, so just follow me. Um, Another thing that draws me to... Batman, the Dark Knight, is how he faced fear from a very young age. So his parents were gunned down by a robber when he was with them, when he was very small. Uh, So he witnessed a very traumatic event as a very young child. 
And he goes on to channel that fear and direct it as enemies. In his words, make my enemies feel my dread. In the Christopher Nolan trilogy casts a formidable foe in the first movie, Batman Begins. That villain's name is Scarecrow. And Scarecrow uses an airborne toxin to inflict the worst possible nightmares and hallucinations on his victims. It's that paralyzing fear. It's that fear that the disciples had that night. At what point at what that point at one point in the movie, Batman is transported back to his childhood trauma after he's uh, exposed to this airborne toxin that he receives from from Scarecrow. Now, in the movie, the resourceful and intelligent Lucius Fox is able to whip up an antidote for Bruce. Sorry, Batman. This antidote eliminates the hallucinogenic and haunting side effects to return his mental condition to what it was before. So what's the point? Uh, faith can be, can be our best antidote for our fear. It's always accessible to us when we turn to trust God over our circumstances, over our doubts, our worries, and ugly situations. Batman may need Lucius Fox to help resolve his fear, but we need faith in Jesus to remedy ours. Point number three, have faith when you feel all alone. The disciples had each other on that boat, the boat that was seemingly about to submerge into the Sea of Galilee. They had their fellow believers there with them, yet they could not have been more alone. In a physical presence, sure, there were others in the boat, and they were panicking all the same. But it's one thing to be alone in the body, and it's, uh, you know, sometimes people just need alone time, or they're too peopled out. But it's quite another thing to be spiritually alone. Being spiritually alone or isolated can result to depression, hopelessness, anxiety, feelings of despair. I was recently introduced to the show Alone. It's a reality show where contestants are placed in the middle of the wilderness and forced to survive on only minimal equipment and resources. And this particular season was set in Australia, specifically the island of Tasmania. And the native Tasmanians, the Palawa, were themselves isolated from the outside world for 8,000 years until European settlers discovered them. Being all alone for survival or being all alone as a people group and isolated is challenging, to say the least. Psalm 34, verse 18 says, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. The Lord is near. Jesus was near to the disciples physically, but also through his teachings, he had the opportunity to share with them, share parables, share teachings. They had the opportunity in turn to practice their faith. The faith was inside of them the whole time, even on that boat. The faith, faith is a choice we are capable of making each day, each hour, each moment in our lives. And we can have that faith because although we may not see the physical evidence in our spirit, the Lord is near. And he is faithful to us through the storm. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. God does not need our faith, but he, deserve, but he desires for us to seek his face. And in doing so, we are reminded that we are not alone. God is near. The eye of the storm is known to be a place of somewhat eerie calm. Jesus was the eye of the storm in our passage. He demonstrated that only what is truly calm and peaceful is able to tame the worst of storms. Jesus, Prince of Peace, Lord of all, he had the authority to calm the storm merely by saying the words, peace, 
be still. No other person could do that. And rightly so, this terrified the disciples. They were beginning to understand that their rabbi was not just another good or righteous teacher. As C.S. Lewis puts it, Jesus can only be classified as three things if you truly read the Gospels. He's either A, a liar, B, a lunatic, or C, Lord. But he can't be simply a good teacher. Jesus displays his lordship to his inner circle, his friends, his disciples, his authority over nature expounded on his disciples' previous views of who he really was. Verse 41, And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Do you believe? Do you believe Jesus can calm the storm inside of you? I don't know what that is, but he does. When life is uncertain, when you feel afraid, when you feel all alone, have faith. And he will be there through it all till you reach the other side. Amen.